We're leaving our time now. We are going to another place now. We're going to a planet where there are eight uh, oceans instead of seven. Where there are five elements instead of earth, water, air, and fire. There's a fifth one. We're going to a planet where things happen over and over again. It's not that as here when everything is novel. In that planet, everything happens over and over again in the same order. And that's what they love about it. There. So, I must tell you then that uh, once there was a young woman who was getting prepared for marriage. And <clears throat> she was with her mother. And her mother uh, said to her, you're going now to be married. Um, and I'm going to send some things with you. You're going a long way off now. And you'll be separated from me. Do you hear this? Coming into this earth? As a soul, do you hear that? I'm going to give you a horse that can talk. The horse's name is Falada. I'm going to give you a maid that can help you. That'll be, after all, you are a princess. The soul is always a princess. And I'm going to give you a maid. And the third thing I'm going to give you is this. And she went out of the room and she pricked her uh, finger uh, and, and uh, some drops of blood came and she put three drops of blood on a beautiful little white handkerchief and gave it to her daughter and said, put this in your breast. Put this in here, here and keep it. It'll help you. It'll give you, remember, so you'll remember me. So those are the three gifts that she got. So she got on her horse and the, she had a beautiful horse, followed her. And the maid had an ugly old rag, right? An old beat up horse kind of a farm horse. She started down towards our world, riding on her great horse, who could talk. <laughs> and then, as you know, she began to get thirsty. She had a longing for water and moisture. So she asked the maid, the maid says, I'm not your damn maid anymore. We're not with your mother now. You want to get water, you get it yourself. She can't believe that. But she gets off her horse and she goes and lies down next to a stream and puts her head down and drinks. Then she comes back and a few miles later she said, oh, I'm so thirsty. Would you, get me, uh, would you give me some water? And the maid says, get your own water. I'm not doing that for you. So she gets off, puts her head down by the water and then because she's so interested in drinking, she doesn't notice that the little handkerchief with the drops of blood has floated down the river. But the maid saw it. And she knew that her power she had from her mother was gone. So when she came back to the horse, the maid says, get on this old horse. I'm taking your horse. And if you ever tell anyone this, I will kill you. In fact, you make a promise right now. I will never tell anyone what has happened to me. Promise me under the wide blue sky. We all agreed. That's called forgetfulness. We can't even remember what happened on the way here because we made a promise. Under the wide blue sky that we would never tell anyone. Under the wide blue sky. So they arrive at the castle, which is our world. <coughs> arrive at the castle, and as soon as they arrive at the castle, the prince comes out, the one who's going to be born, the one who's written to the mother and asked for this woman, this soul to come, and they're going to be born, but, but, but he, he tends to look at the horse. Huh? Is this so? Remember when you were 16? All he did is look at a horse. He looks at the horse and there's this ugly woman on it, but he pretends not to see it. And there's a beautiful woman on an old ratty horse out of his range. There was an old man, there's an old king from watching from the second floor window, and he notices, that's so strange. The one on the bad horse is a beautiful one. He just starts the way in his head. And so the prince comes out and he says, oh, wonderful, you are my bride coming from the other world. It's so wonderful to see you. But the young man is a little blind and, and uh, so he takes her and um, he married the ugly bride. But I want you to remember that how old you were when you married the ugly bride. Mm -hmm. Was there any older man around you who knew it was wrong? But the older men don't know whether to say anything or not. Mm -hmm. Is that right? <coughs> it's a part of life on this planet that you marry the, the ugly bride. The question is how ugly, of course, but <laughs> we're not talking about women here now. 
It's a part of your own soul that you married. Is that right? This goes on and uh, she says, uh, find somewhere for this little shit girl to live. Closet would be good. Fine. And by the way, they've given her a job, which is uh, herding geese. So after they've been married in uh, a couple of days and she's with her husband, she says, listen, uh, do you love me? Oh, sure, I love you. I want you to do a favor for me, will you? Oh, certainly, whatever you'd want. Uh, what is the favor? Oh, it's not a big thing. What is it? I want you to call a knacker and have that big horse killed. It's called in German the knacker. Call the knacker and kill that horse. But wait a minute, that's probably the most beautiful horse in the whole kingdom. Do you love me or not? Make up your mind. You can be sleeping on the floor if you don't do what I say. Well, what the hell, he's 17, what can you do? His brain isn't fully formed. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, oh, okay, I don't like it, but I'll do it, you know, for you, dear. So he calls the knacker, and the knacker comes in and uh, kills the horse. Interesting, interesting, huh? That's why we can't even predict the future anymore. That's a very serious moment when the horse is killed. The touching thing about the story is that she herself goes to the knacker and she says, I want you to do a favor for me if you would. What is it? I know you killed the horse. I'd like you to put the horse's head up in that place where we leave from the castle in the morning. He said, well, that's kind of a weird thing to do. Well, I'd appreciate it if you just nail the horse's head up there. Because I love that horse, and they've given the beautiful one a job, herding geese. Herding geese is a famous old emblem in the um, world of the occult and the esoteric, meaning to try to get your thoughts trained so they don't run everywhere. How many of you sat down to try to write something and your thoughts are gone? on? Just like geese. They're gone, 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 gone. Every morning she goes out through the gate with a whole group of geese, and she does her herding. That's a very lowly job, herding geese. By the way, the horse had a name, Falada. Falada. Nobody knows what it means. It has an Arab feeling to it, Falada. So she goes out with her geese, and she goes underneath that archway. That's something very beautiful about that. I don't understand it myself, but there's a stone archway. And she goes through it in the morning, and the horse's head is up there. And uh, since it's about 5.30 in the morning, no one's around, and she says, Falada, Falada, what grief it gives me to see you hanging there. And Falada says, if your mother knew what has happened to you, her heart would break in two. So every morning, this is, it's not a bad exchange, hmm? It's not a bad exchange. And every morning she goes out with the geese and says, Oh, Falada, it caused me such grief to see you hanging there. And he says, If your mother knew what has happened to you, her heart would break in two. It's important that people tell us that, isn't it, right? That's being in the community. Yeah. Her heart would break in two. So then there's a very bizarre part of this story, which is so wonderful, and people have been struggling about what it means for a long time. It turns out that there's a young man named Conrad. And Conrad is in love with the beautiful woman's beautiful hair. She has gorgeous hair. And so every time she goes out there, she starts to comb her hair. And Conrad has his little song, and he says, Oh, your hair is so beautiful. You know, could I, could I, could I just touch your hair? Could I do that? As a real nerd, right? <laughs> Can I just touch your beautiful hair? Can I touch your beautiful hair? You need a trickster, don't you? Mm. And shit like that comes around. So she sits down, ignoring Conrad. She begins to comb her long golden hair in the sunlight. Hmm? And she says, oh, wind, 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 would you please take Conrad's hat and blow it all over the meadow so that he will chase it all afternoon and I can comb my hair. 
<laughs> and the wind does what you ask it to do, and it blows off Conrad's hat, and he runs here, and he runs there, and he spends a whole afternoon running after his hat. By that time, it's five o'clock, it's time for her to go back, and Conrad comes in looking really pissed off. So no one knows what this is. But it must be that restless mind that the Hindus talk about, that's always moving, always getting a new thought. Whatever that is, we know that's one of the problems that happens to our soul too, isn't that right? Our soul has such beautiful hair that in a way it starts to be surrounded by people who, who try to distract us. Is that right? Mm. Combing your golden hair is like writing a poem. <laughs> and someone's going to come in pretty soon and say, oh, oh, the car's got a flat tire. And, oh, are you going to make any money out of this? You know, all those things. And that's Conrad stuff. So there's one question that isn't answered, what is the hare? She sits out in the meadow while the, ge the geese are winding around. She starts to comb her hair. Combs it. What is that? I can't tell you that I solved it. I didn't. I've told the story like eight times. I never understood a word about it. Until, in that situation, until I read a couple of Sufis uh, in the, that tradition. So we don't know. Once in a while you run into a detail, but the most amazing detail to me of the whole Persian Sufi view of the whole thing is that when a woman's hair is, is thrown out like this and is wild in the wind, that stands for this world. It's chaotic hair. Huh? That's so interesting. And then when you comb it, that's like being a learned person, a learned man or a learned woman. You learn that the world is not chaotic. And, and you do your hair. You remember how the, the, the Egyptians are always shown with this gorgeous hair? How the Greeks are shown with this gorgeous hair? This is a very old thing. And one way to help you overcome your, your longing to get in, in, you know, in pop culture, to get completely inundated by the world, is to teach someone to do their hair well. Those little ringlets that the French had. A lot of African women have it right now. Beautiful work with the hair. I'm just throwing this out to you. I can't defend it, but it lit that up for me for the first time. Conrad is trying to distract her from her combing her hair. This is like with someone trying to prevent you from being a cultured person. Isn't that interesting? So, huh? That's what our whole culture is. Yeah, so Conrad is, is Elvis. <laughs> Conrad, you know, Conrad is Madonna. And the idea of Mata Madonna reciting R uh, Rumi is one of the most ridiculous things that's ever happened in this world. She'll take Rumi and unbind the hair. Isn't that what she'll do? And Rumi's whole work is in binding up the hair and making sure you understand that how beautiful the world is, especially there's this line, I have feasted on uh, learning and culture, and uh, I have become beautiful, or something like that. They don't have our freakish view that culture and learning will destroy you. Hmm. Persians don't have that. So, anyway, so things are going okay, except that you've got Conrad's anger developing more and more. Well, what happens is that one day Conrad goes to the king, and he says, I'm sick of this whole thing. I mean, I get sent out there uh, herding geese and stuff like that, and every day she, uh, you know, she does something with her hair, and all of a sudden the wind blows my hat off, and I run the whole fucking afternoon trying to pick up my hat, and I'm sick of this. Just like he said, I'm sick of it, I'm sick of it, I'm sick of it. And the king said, uh, oh, you've been going out with her. What is that about the hair? Well, I don't know. She just sits out there combing her hair all afternoon, and and, uh, and besides that, she talks to this dead horse's head. What does she say to the horse? So he tells the whole story. And the king, as they say, realizes an injustice has been done. So he realizes that's the situation. The best part of you is exiled. And is not a part of your life. All the gold is with that one. He goes and talks to her and he says, there's, I hear that, you know, you talk to this dead horse's head and uh, something about your mother there. And, um, 
And uh, what happened? I can't say. Why can't you say? Well, because I took a vow that under the wide blue sky, I would never say what had happened to me. This is called resistance to psychology, among other things. <laughs> I don't want to go to a therapist. <laughs> right? I promised God I'd never go to a therapist. You know? <laughs> a lot of people get stuck right there, and nothing ever happens in their lives. And he says, well, I got another idea here. We got a nice big iron stove. Now, suppose you climbed in the stove and just set it to the stove. That wouldn't be breaking your promise, would it? She says, no, I guess not. Because the original promise was under the blue sky. If I'm in the stove, I'm not under the blue sky. He says, that's good thinking. That's exactly right. Do you feel the trickster is coming near? <laughs> so he, he says, you can do this without any fear of violation. Get in the stove and say. So she gets in the stove and she says, I want to say, oh, God, I tell him this one out this one. And he's at his ear, you know. And he hears the whole thing. He hears it all. She's able to weep at last. Your soul is able to say how much, how much grief it feels. It's wonderful. It's a good advantage of getting older is that your soul is somehow able to tell these things. And the pain a man and wife feel at breakfast each day comes from decisions made in heaven. He hears all that and the king says to his son, you know, I think it's time for a party. We haven't had a party in this place for a long time. Let's have a party. Okay, we'll have a big banquet. Okay. So they arrange the whole thing with a big banquet, and the king goes and gets some beautiful clothes and puts it on the princess. Hmm? So she's brilliantly clothed. And so when the party is going on, the young prince is sitting there with his ugly bride. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, lice is coming out of her hair and maggots dropping off her ears and everything, but nobody notices, you know? <laughs> Um, you know, she's not too good a conversationalist, but what can you do, you know? So suddenly, uh, he brings the bride in and she sits down. Actually, she's so changed by being seen that nobody recognizes her. That's nice. Sets, sets her down right there. And then the king says, uh, I want to tell a story. You know, we got to have a story at a banquet, don't we? Yeah, I got to have a story. Okay, here's the story. One time a, a, a person came along and they had a, there were two women. One was on a big horse and the other's horse. And then he goes through the whole story that just happened in front of them, you know. And so, uh, and he says, what do you think ought to happen to a false bride like that uh, who has done that trickery with her own uh, mistress? What do you think should happen? And the ugly bride who doesn't recognize anymore the beautiful one says, I think uh, anyone who do something like that, I think they should be put in a keg full of nails with the nails put in inside, and then they should roll this woman down the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> so then uh, the, uh, uh, the, guy, the king, or the old king speaks, and he said, that's very good. That's a good sentence. You've chosen it for yourself. You are the one who's going in the barrel. <laughs> Moment of revelation taught too much. <laughs> but you see, it's very cunning too, because that one inside of you knows that something is wrong. Something is completely wrong. You've been acting like an idiot for 20 years. And uh, so, don't have any pity now. This is where the New Age gets in trouble. Because at this point in the story, you get a good New Age person, they say, I think that you just put her on vegetables and, um, you know, and you talk to her a little bit, you know what I mean? And to tell her about this thing. I think she'd really understand. You gotta understand. Needs a keg full of nails. It's the only thing this person understands. <laughs> so uh, that's the way it's done. That's the way it's done. She's put in and rolled down. And then the prince marries the genuine bride. And you're back together again as God intended you to be from the beginning.